Well, good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Uh, I'm so glad that you've chosen to tune in and to dive into God's Word together. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 20. And so you can go ahead and start turning there and finding your place. And, and as you do that, I want you to think about this question just to get us started today. What are some things that you shouldn't ignore? What are some things that you shouldn't ignore? Uh, maybe something came to your mind. Uh, maybe a, 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 a warning such as a, a, a check engine light on your vehicle. Uh, maybe it's a, a commands from uh, whether it's a, a police officer or just uh, instructions that you're receiving uh, from a, a, an adult or a parent uh, or maybe a spouse, uh, some specific people in your life. Uh, there are various things that we shouldn't ignore in life. And so, uh, I guess the follow-up question is, what can happen if we do ignore those things? What happens if we end up ignoring those things we shouldn't? Well, if it has to do with your car, you might end up walking, uh, walking to work, walking to where you need to go, and that wouldn't be the best idea. Um, uh, if you ignore the commands or the instructions of the road, uh, you might end up uh, go getting a ticket or going to jail. Right? depending on how severe that is. Uh, if you uh, don't wait, um, if, if you don't uh, listen to the instructions, if you ignore the instructions, uh, my mind goes to um, cooking noodles. If you put the noodles in the water before the water is boiling, uh, you're going to wait a long time for those noodles to be ready. It's not going to work right, so you got to follow the instructions. Uh, whatever the case is, uh, when you ignore something, there are consequences. And so, as we're going to find out today, we're going to dive in and look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to see uh, what, what happens if you ignore the gospel, or we're going to see what happens if you receive the gospel. And so um, that's just something for us to think about. And, and so Paul is going to talk about the response that people had to the gospel. The, the context for today, if you were with us last week, you saw and you heard where Paul basically talked about the fact that he shared the gospel. He shared the gospel boldly, but he shared the gospel with care and concern and compassion. And so that was the, the means, the method. How did he share the gospel? He did it out of love and concern, but with boldness. Uh, but today, we're looking at the way that people responded. And there's really two responses that we're going to dive into. There's some who received it and some who rejected the gospel. And so that's what we're going to look, look at. Uh, we're going to start in verses 13 through 14, and, and we're going to see how the Thessalonians, there were many of them who received the gospel. And so as we uh, begin this section, I, I kind of want to uh, take you back to writing papers. Uh, when you wrote papers in school, why did you have to cite your work? Likely you, you had to do a research paper and you had to, to, to give footnotes and cite your work. And uh, why did you do that? Likely it was because that's what your professors told you. So you just listened to instructions. Also, uh, you did that so you didn't get, uh, get in trouble for plagiarism. Uh, because if it's not your words, you got to cite it. Really, uh, it also helps to show that you did the research. That you found some people who could speak with authority on the matter. And so, uh, why is that important? Because what we're about to see is that the believers, uh, the individuals in Thessalon Thessalonica, received the message that Paul spoke and that Paul gave with the understanding that it was coming from God. And so, what we need to remember, and as we read this, when, if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation and we are ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors for God. And, and we're being sent to plead, to, to make an appeal with people to hear the gospel. And it's not our message. Uh, an ambassador doesn't put their own information in. An ambassador simply speaks what they're told to. And so if we're ambassadors for Christ, we're speaking God's word. And that's what Paul was doing. And that's what the, the individuals in Thessalonica realized and understood. So look at verse 13 through 14. This is why we constantly thank God. Because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as a human message, but as it truly is, the word of God, which also works effectively in you who believe. For you 
brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, since you have also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. So we see here in verses 13 through 14, uh, Paul essentially repeating what he said, uh, what we looked at last week. Uh, He was very thankful for the church in Philippi. Excuse me, he was very thankful for the church in Thessalonica. And in chapter 1, we see that as well. He gave thanks to God for what uh, he had done, how he had worked in their midst. And the same is being said here. So he's constantly giving thanks. And what is he giving thanks for? He's giving thanks for the facts that they received the word, not as just simply Paul talking and in his own wisdom, but as God speaking through him, bringing the message of salvation. Uh, it's really helpful and, and, and important to understand that the gospel is not a human invention. It's a divine revelation. And so God's word reveals the message of the gospel. Paul, he didn't have the freedom to change the message. He simply was responsible to share the message and to re- to share what had been revealed to him. And so um, the Thessalonians, they recognized that what Paul was saying was from God. They recognized it and they believed it. And so that's what we start off with in verse 13. Paul's thankfulness for them receiving the message as coming from God, his word bringing the gospel. And we also see that it was effective. The word there for effective, it works effectively in you. Um, it's this idea of just simply work. Uh, the, the, God's word went to work in their life. It, it changed them. It transformed them. And, and the Bible is full of passages that talk about the transforming power of God's word, the transforming power of God's word. Um, there's just a, a verse that I, I kind of want to uh, reference and you're probably familiar with is in Isaiah. It says that, so my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper in what I send it to do. And so this picture is a picture of God's words uh, being effective and, and, and the Bible is effective. Hebrews 4 talks about the fact that the the Word of God is living and effective and sharper than any double-edged sword, penetrating as far as the separations of the soul and spirit, joints, and marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's Word is powerful, and it pierces the heart. It convicts people, And, and, and we see that happening in the church in Thessalonica. And we see that happening through Paul's missionary journey there. He was preaching and it was taking effect. In another passage, Paul talks about the fact that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness. Just before that, it said that um, the sacred scriptures are able to give you wisdom for salvation. What what the picture is being painted here um, is very clear about the effectiveness of God's word, the effectiveness of God's word. And that's what happened. Paul preached, they believed, and it changed their lives. And that was, it was very important and encouraging to Paul as well. And so he's thankful for that. We're going to shift though. Verse 14 is, uh, it's, it is talking about their, what happened when they received the scripture, but it talks about the um, persecution. Um, so here it says, for you, brothers and sisters, you became imitators of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. We'll talk about the persecution in just a second. Uh, This first half of the verse talks about um, they were being imitators. Earlier, Paul said that they were imitating him. Uh, He and Timothy and Silas lived out the Christian life, and the, the believers, those who trusted in Thessalonica, they were imitating Paul. But not only did they imitate Paul, they had the other churches around that demonstrated what it looked like to uh, remain faithful in the midst of persecution. And so they, they followed the example of the other churches in the area. Um, and uh, back in Judea, not just in Thessalonica. So they, they saw the example of what God was doing and how God was working in the midst of the church. And, and so unfortunately, uh, it was challenging. But I think it's awesome to see that God used this persecution in Judea to send people out 
How did they learn about it? Because people from the church came and they were in these various areas. And so um, they suffered persecution. So what does it say in the second part of verse 14? Since you also suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. You suffered the same things from people of your own country, just as they did from the Jews. Um, it's interesting to note that many of the believers in Judea were mostly Jewish uh, believers. They were um, Jew, Jews by birth. Uh, they were um, worshiping in the synagogues and their temples, and they were Jewish, but they came to receive the gospel, and for that, they suffered persecution. In Thessalonica, most of the believers there were Gentile. They were non-Jews. Um, and so we have the Jewish and the Gentiles, uh, Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles being everyone who's not a Jew, essentially. Um, and, and, and really, uh, we see that they all had the same thing in common. They were suffering for their faith. They were being persecuted for the faith that they had. Um, and so um, we see uh, this, this um, persecution taking effect and, and being, uh, being a hindrance to the church, yet we see their example of being bold and trusting in God, taking root in affecting the people in Thessalonica, the believers in Thessalonica. And so when you read the book of Acts, you're going to see how the Jews persecuted the early believers, but you're going to see how God encouraged them and gave them boldness to live for him no matter what. And so I was looking at this and thinking about imitators, right? If you're going to imitate someone, you should pick a, a role model, someone who you want to imitate. Paul was a role model. The churches in Judea were a role model. And so I guess my question is, how does someone become a role model? Uh, so a person we should aspire to be like, uh, we should follow. Um, I don't know uh, what what you're thinking about right now. Perhaps you're thinking about a role model you have in your life or, or you're hoping that you're uh, going to be a role model for someone. I would say that the way someone becomes a role model is not by doing what's easy. It's, it's becoming a role model through years of consistent living and hard work. I think this applies in general. Think of a, a, a very much of a, uh, an ath athlete or uh, in sports, someone who's put in the hard work and the dedication and, and they've got a good attitude and they do well in the field. They're a role model, someone to imitate their work ethic. Uh, but when you think about it in, in the church, uh, someone who is persevering in the faith, in the good times and the bad times, in the, in the ups and the downs, that individual who's trusting in God no matter what, that is a role model. And so the church at Thessalonica was able to look to the other churches and to see what it looked like to remain faithful in the midst of opposition. So they received the word and they imitated other believers. They followed the example of those around them, including Paul. And so Paul preached the gospel, they received it, they believed, and it transformed their lives. In verses 15 and 16, however, we're going to see that there were people who rejected. It was kind of introduced in verse 14 uh, that the Jews were persecuting um, the church. They persecuted the church in Judea. In Thessalonica, they were receiving uh, opposition uh, and suffering on the, on, from people um, in their own country, so both the Jews and the Gentiles. They were receiving persecution. Um, and so what are we going to look at and learn about those who reject the gospel? I guess we should first of all back up and ask this, why do people reject the gospel? Why do people reject the gospel? Well, if you think about it a little bit, uh, something that comes to my mind is pride, uh, self-centeredness, thinking about yourself um, and not really caring about the, the way that your, your actions affect others. Uh, just just d selfish desires of the flesh. Um, and, and a passage in Scripture, John, in John chapter 3, we see that um, we see that what the Bible says is that they loved the darkness, right? It says that they love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. And so what it looks like, the reason people reject the gospel is because uh, we are sinners. We, are, we have fallen short of the glory of God and our selfish desires uh, keep us uh, from seeking that which is right. And so uh, the gospel 
is God's grace. It's, it's, it's God's lifeline, so to speak. He's, he's calling out and he's calling anyone, uh, everyone to listen and to hear and to repent. Um, and so um, the, people, the reason people reject the gospel is because of the sin in their life. Uh, James talks about the fact that we're drawn away by our own desires and um, tempted to sin. And when we give in to sin, when we give in to the temptation, sin uh, results in death. And, and so that's why people reject it. And what we're going to see in verses 15 and 16 is an example of the wrath of God coming on those who reject the gospel. So here we go. Verse 15 says this, chapter 2, verse 15. Um, from the Jews who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us. They displease God and are hostile to everyone by keeping us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. As a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit and wrath has overtaken them at last. The, the picture here is, is a pretty bleak picture. Paul is pointing to the role that the Jewish leaders had in um, instigating Jesus' death. He's not saying all Jews put Jesus to death. He's saying that the, um, the Jewish people rejected the gospel. And, and if you look in Matthew chapter 27, uh, you see how when Jesus was brought before Pilate, um, that they were the ones who... Um, basically stirred up the crowd and said, got them to say, crucify him. Uh, verse 1 says, uh, they plotted against Jesus to put him to death. And after tying him up, they led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Uh, the, they couldn't crucify Jesus. They didn't have the authority. The Romans did that. But they were very much involved in making it happen uh, because they saw what Jesus was doing. They saw what, heard what Jesus was saying, and they recognized that he was claiming to be God, and they called that blasphemy, and so they wanted him to be put to death. Um, and so again, um, Paul is, is pointing to the role uh, of the religious leaders and those who rejected Jesus. Um, he's not talking to the Jewish people as a nation. Uh, he's talking to those who instigated this rebel, um, rejection of Christ and the gospel. And we also see here, though, that they, they were the ones who rejected the prophets, and, and they were the ones who persecuted us, likely Paul, Timothy, and the other churches. And, and so uh, the, the picture is very clear. Um, they were driving out the gospel. They were hindering the gospel, the good news, the Messiah, um, the message of the Messiah. They were rejecting it and driving them out and persecuting them. And so what is the result of this? I think it's pretty self-evident, but uh, it was displeasing to God. They were working against God. The person, uh, the, the, the one that they would claim to follow and obey, um, but they rejected the Messiah. And so they were hostile to everyone. Uh, the words there, they displeased God. It's one thing to reject God, but it's another thing to actively hinder other people from knowing the gospel and hearing the gospel. And so um, they hindered the spread of the gospel, and therefore they were an enemy of all people because the, the message of the gospel is a message of hope and of salvation. And so that's the picture of those who rejected the gospel. Uh, Paul talks about it. He's likely bringing this up to um, to bring a, um, a condemnation against the actions of the people in Thessalonica. Not the believers, but those outside who are persecuting them. He was saying, this is wrong. You're working against God. Um, and so I guess the question for us to uh, evaluate and to think about as believers is, according to the Bible, how should we respond when we face hostility or rejection? As Christians, how should we respond when we face hostility or rejection? Really, the only answer is to love your enemy, to love your enemies. In Matthew chapter 5, we see Jesus talk about this, and he says, You have heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and send rain, sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? 
Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And Jesus is pointing to the, the love and the compassion that, and the, really the grace that God extends to even sinners. Um, we know in Matthew, uh, excuse me, Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Um, the, Paul here is talking about the fact that their continual rejection of the, the gospel. They heard the gospel preached, yet they rejected it and were driving them out, persecuting uh, Paul and other believers. Constant and consistent rejection of the gospel leads to what we see in verse 16. It leads to the wrath of God uh, because there is punishment for the sin that we do. So verse 16 says this, they, how did they do it? They kept us from speaking to the Gentiles so that, we, that, so that they may be saved. The message of the gospel leads to salvation. And so as a result, they are constantly filling up their sins to the limit. The picture there is like a cup and you're pouring water in it. And as you keep pouring water, eventually it's going to overflow. So God's wrath is going to overtake them and, and it's going to be overflown. Um, uh, overflowing uh, out of the cup. And so their sin, um, God is patient. Um, he doesn't strike them on the first one. He doesn't pass judgment on them on the first one. He desires to show patience, but there is a limit. And so really, this is likely pointing to the fact that um, whether here on earth while you're alive or whenever uh, you die and you face the judgment, um, you are going to be held accountable. God is going to hold them accountable. And so they're, they're guilty of sin. And one thing I, I really want to say and what the, what's important is notice that, um, that Paul was formerly a persecutor of the church. He was in that category. He was someone who rejected the gospel, rejected uh, the, the, the Christian church, the, the followers of the way. He was persecuting them, and he was working actively against the gospel and against Jesus. In fact, uh, when, when Paul encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, uh, the Lord said, why are you persecuting me? Why are you working against me? Why are you driving me out? And, and so the picture being painted here is, uh, Paul's not saying they're without hope. They're, the gospel's not for them. Paul's saying that they are continually rejecting the gospel and therefore they are condemned uh, to, to face the wrath of God. And so John 3.16, a very familiar verse, John 3.16 talks about the fact that um, God loved the world, that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But the very next verse, uh, verse 17 says um, <clears throat> that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned. But anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one, um, excuse me, in the name of the one and only Son of God. And so the message of the gospel is not, if you don't believe, you will be condemned. The message of the gospel is, uh, you're already condemned. It's bad news and you're already condemned, but the good news is that Jesus has sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. And so um, the, the, the consequences for rejecting the gospel is to, uh, to suffer the punishment uh, that we deserve. We all deserve punishment, but the gospel is a message of forgiveness, and so we need to respond to it. Um, and so uh, Paul is not calling action against the enemies. Uh, against the people who uh, persecuted him. Paul's not uh, calling for an uprising, so to speak, in revolt. What Paul is simply saying is he's so thankful that the believers, those in the church at Thessalonica, had received the gospel. Because if you reject the gospel and work against Christ, you are going to receive the wrath of God. So what, is that, uh, what does that bring us to? Um, and uh, I guess uh, it, it makes me think of Stephen. Uh, we're talking about this, the, the fact that they're going to face wrath and, and how do you respond in the face of, of uh, opposition and persecution. In, in Acts chapter 7, and I would encourage you to read it when you get a chance, but in Acts chapter 7 you see Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And at the very end he says, uh, this is what it says in verse 59. So Acts 7 verse 59, while they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he fell asleep. 
They were killing him, yet he expressed a desire of forgiveness. Uh, he called God not to hold this against them. He had a deep concern for their salvation. And even though he was about to die, he wanted, um, he wanted God to continue to extend salvation to them and, and forgiveness. And so S Stephen really followed the example of Jesus. Because on the cross, Jesus said, Forgive them because they know not what they are doing. Uh, we see that even whenever we are being opposed, our concern should be for the, the gospel to go forward. Uh, that through the, the, the boldness and the, the perseverance of saints in the midst of opposition, that people will see that and will come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. And the gospel is awesome and empower, powerful in that. And so Paul, we talked about it last week, Paul was emboldened by God to preach the gospel in spite of great opposition. And Paul here is saying he's so thankful that they believed because if they didn't, they would face the wrath of God. So um, we're going to look at verses 17 through 20. We see how they respond and they received the gospel. We see how some, of, some people rejected the gospel and actively worked against it. But now we're going to see Paul's uh, kind of response and, and his focus in the midst of all of this going on. Um, and so uh, before we read verses 17 through 20, I kind of want to ask a question about discipleship. What does it mean to disciple others? What does it look like? What does it involve to disciple others? Christian discipleship involves encouraging and helping others grow and mature in their personal walk with Christ. That is what Christian discipleship looks like, helping others uh, grow in their walk with Christ. And so discipleship means having a, a genuine care and concern for the spiritual well-being of other believers, fellow believers. And so Paul, he had that, and that's, that was his goal. And that's why he was writing this letter. That's why he was so thankful, because he cared for them, and he desired for them to walk in their relationship with Christ in a way that's worthy of the gospel. So verses 17 through 20, I'm just going to read it. It says, But as for us, brothers and sisters, after we were forced to leave you for a short time, in person, not in heart, we greatly desired and made every effort to return and see you face to face. So we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again. But Satan hindered us, for who is our hope or joy or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. The picture being painted, Paul's reminding him he didn't desire to leave. They were forced to leave. Uh, the Greek word there of being forced to leave is kind of this idea of being torn away, ripped away. Uh, and so the, the word can also mean, uh, it, it can be translated as being make an orphan of. And so it, it really points back to what Paul was just saying, what we covered last week, is that he viewed himself as a parent to the belie uh, believers in Thessalonica, as a mother, uh, care and concern and compassion, but as a father, as instruction and encouragement and support. And so we see um, that Paul viewed them as his children, and he was torn away. He was forced to leave, yet he has desired over and over again to return. The word there time and again is literally translated as once and twice. Um, basically, Paul's saying is it wasn't just a fleeting thought, hey, I'd love to uh, visit the, the believers in Thessalonica. It was a constant uh, reminder, something that he was actively trying to visit them and not just a whim. And so he desired, his care and his concern uh, was calling him to minister to them and to visit them. Uh, but there, this was what we read. It said that Satan hindered us. Satan hindered us. So Paul doesn't really explain how Satan hindered him. Some people think it was related to Paul's thorn in the flesh, and so a physical ailment, he couldn't travel. Uh, other people uh, think it could be just persecution, and that's very, very likely as well. But interestingly, the, the, the Greek word there for hindered uh, was described to use, excuse me, was just used to describe roads that were destroyed or made impassable. And so really this hindrance is something that just stopped him from traveling there. Um, it could have been related to the fact that in, when Paul was in Thessalonica, um, they, they made trouble for him. And, and some, some people even paid a bond to get Paul out so that they could leave. And so uh, perhaps it was related, related to that. But the point is, is what we see is that 
Paul wanted them to know that he had them close to his heart. His desire was to uh, pursue a relationship with them and to, to come and visit them, but it wasn't working out. Before we move on from this, I, I do really want to quickly state is that the Bible is clear that Satan does not have power over God. <clears throat> if you look back to Job and you remember that the devil was subject to God's authority. He had to request permission to do something, and God allowed it in the life of Job. And so um, I was thinking of, of Joseph. Uh, in Genesis, we see Joseph. Um, he said in ver, uh, Genesis 15, 50, verse 20, 20, Genesis 50, verse 20, he said, You planned evil against me, but God planned it for good, to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. And so Paul is saying this. He's like, I want to be there, but Satan is hindering us. And it's, it's, uh, it's very helpful to remem remember that that doesn't mean that we don't believe God is in control. In fact, what the devil means for, uh, for evil, for wrong, for hindering the gospel, God can even use for the furtherment of the gospel. In fact, think about the fact that Jesus died on the cross. Uh, the devil thought he won, but in fact, that was the means of salvation to the whole world. And so... Uh, we're looking at this, and we're seeing this passage here, um, and really there is opposition. And so the question for us is, to, what are some of the things that get in the way of our discipleship and growing in our walk with God? What are some things that get in our way of discipleship? I would say distance. You know, if you move away, it's kind of hard. If you had someone you're, you're growing together uh, in the Lord, you're, you're pursuing Christ, you're encouraging each other, and then you move away, it can be challenging. Um, maybe apathy, just not really caring, not thinking that it matters to grow in your walk with God. That can really hinder someone's discipleship. Sin, uh, sin can, can really uh, shame us and, and, and really hinder us. If, if we allow the devil to, and the lie of, of um, shame to overcome us, if we don't confess our sin and trust and turn to God, then that can hinder us. Busyness, there are many things that get in the way of discipleship. But here's the thing, what did Paul consider valuable. He considered believers and their walk with God to be very important. That's what he says in verses 19 through 20. For who is our hope, our joy, or crown of boasting in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. There are many things that we consider to be valuable in our lives. A house, time, memories, people, etc. But really, the most important thing is a relationship with Christ. So first and foremost, that's, that's what you need to do. Have you come to know Christ? But second, it's to pursue uh, a discipleship uh, system in your life, uh, intentional discipleship, growing together in the Lord with others around you. And so Paul, his value system was very clear. So how do we apply this though? We've seen that some people received, some people rejected, and Paul was focused on the believers in Thessalonica. So what does this look like for us? I would say there's three things to think about. I would say the first thing is when, when you receive Christ, when you receive the gospel, know that the gospel changes everything. There's a transformation that happens. And so we are to imitate Christ. Uh, the believers here in Thessalonica, they imitated Paul. They imitated these other churches who were being persecuted. Uh, we, our, our priorities are changed when we come to the gospel. And so if that hasn't happened for you, I'd encourage you to do that. The second thing I would remind you of and, and point out is that rejecting Christ means remaining condemned. Uh, the, the, the Jewish people who were opposing the gospel, they were uh, facing the wrath of God because of the rejection of the gospel. They had heard it, but they rejected it. And so the Bible is very clear. We are condemned because of our sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We remain condemned when we reject the gospel. And so God, uh, God sends out the gospel. God sends out people to bring the gospel to those who need to hear it. And so we need to proclaim the gospel. But if we reject it, if people reject it, they will remain condemned. And so the final thing is this. Iron sharpens iron. We need to be intentional about discipleship. Paul's focus and his desire was to be with them, but he was being hindered. They didn't stop him, though, from writing a letter and sending others and encouraging them and, and challenging them and instructing them. And so we need to do the same, uh, whether it's writing letters or just driving over in a car to visit with a, a fellow believer. We need to understand that iron sharpens iron. 
thank you for uh, being a part of this uh, uh, Sunday school lesson this morning, for studying God's Word with me. Um, I would encourage you to read back over the chapter 2. It's a very important chapter. It talks about the gospel, how to proclaim it, and how to receive it, and, and what it looks like if people reject it and the dangers of that. And so look back over chapter 2. Read it again and really ask God to, um, to really convict your heart uh, where he needs to and encourage you as well to stand firm for the gospel. Uh, I'm going to pray for us. We'll be dismissed. Dear God, thank you for your grace and mercy, for your kindness in the midst of, of um, difficulty in some people's lives uh, and joy and, and happiness in others. Um, no matter what the circumstances, we see from Paul, we see from the church at Thessalonica, we see from the church in Judea, churches in Judea that we can trust in you and be joyful in the midst of persecution. And we can be uh, kind and considerate to others no matter what's going on. Thank you for the encouragement that Paul gave the, the, the church in Thessalonica. God, please encourage us as we desire to live for you. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.